Hi everyone, my name is Matt Brown and welcome to the Direct Private Investment Show. With me in the studio is Bruce Roberts, the CEO of Carapin. Bruce, welcome to the show. Thank you, Matt. Good to be here. Privilege is all ours. Uh, so for our investment community, uh, Bruce, out there who are curious about this venture investing mm. space, how do you approach evaluating a venture deal? Sure. Well, let's first define what we mean by venture. Uh, I would define venture as really any company, an operating business, that has not achieved positive cash flow. Uh, because if it doesn't have positive cash flow, it's not, it can't be sustained without additional investment. And it, to me, that's a pretty bright line test. And just to kind of differentiate that from, say, what we would call private equity, you know, in the world of private equity, uh, you really look at measures of cash flow, uh, EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization to get wonky on you. Uh, multiples of that is how you would value those businesses. But today, well, let's talk about venture because, you know, venture is arguably a much more subjective uh, world. And, and you know, as I like to say, there's no guardrails coming in in venture. You're not listed on an exchange. You probably don't have audited financial statements. Uh, going in, you probably don't know the entrepreneur, the people behind the business. Who, who knows what the, uh, the unknowns are, but they're many and varied. And, and so the idea is how do you begin to get a framework within which you can say, okay, as venture goes, because it's a high risk investment, okay, they're hitting some of the touchstones that, that I think give us a chance of success here. Got it. And so um, where do you start? Do you start with the business model? Do you start with the founder? Do you start with the management team? Do you start with the total addressable market? Where do you start? Yeah, well, I've created a, or defined what I call the nine leaps of faith, okay, that you as the prospective investor need to, to get over. So it's not one leap of faith, this is nine <laughs> that, that that sort of go with the venture investment. Um, you know, number one uh, would be management. Um, you know, the people that you're interfacing with, uh, once you've made the investment, uh, you'll be dependent upon to deliver a return on that investment. So, um, any number of things. Do they have the professional backgrounds that suggest they know the industry? Um, that, you know, is, I think it's necessary that you know the market you're building a product or a solution into. But, you know, one thing which is a bit more subtle, maybe, uh, have they even launched a company before? Have they launched a venture business? I mean, there are serial entrepreneurs. Uh, we have a number of them that are clients of ours. And you know, th those, those folks, know the, you know, the rough and tumble of starting a business from scratch and getting to the point that you've got something of demonstrable value that, you know, can be sold or, and is generating cash flow. So uh, I would say you start with management and, um, you know, is this their first rodeo or not? It's not necessarily the end of the world, but is, and obviously the younger they are, the less likely they would have started a business. Um, you know, I'm not a big believer that you can put entrepreneurship in a model. And, you know, drink it somewhere, take the course, whatever. There's a lot of human factors and probably amongst, um, you know, creativity is, is a big deal. Vision is a big deal, but perseverance is essential. Yeah. So having been in a situation where you founded multiple companies in, in the past, even if they failed, makes you ex experienced. And so a more experienced founder lends itself to evaluating a venture deal in other words like if you had someone that would never founded a company before or someone who's founded six who would you back you would back the more experienced person most of the time yeah you would you would learn more about that person from that you would get a sense of what makes them tick i'm not a big fan of uh failure is good uh, i've actually spoken at, at events that were all about failure and uh i guess i haven't been invited back because you know i'm not there to wave the flag failure is great i think you know, well, there are cases where failure can't be an option or you just won't gut through what you need to do to be successful. But, but having said that, a failure is also not uh, a recipe for running away from someone. I think you learn a lot from failure. Uh, but what you also want to be careful about is, you know, somebody who fails a lot, uh, you know, are you just another failure in their resume? And, and so, you know, it's a balancing. Absolutely. Let's talk about product. Yeah. Um, what role does that play in evaluating a venture deal? For instance, do you back a product that's just making an existing product or service incrementally better? Or do you prefer when evaluating a venture deal 
those types of scalable products right. that are truly disruptive in nature. Well, I'm a real fan of a Harvard professor named Clayton Christensen, who quite a few years ago wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. And um, in that book, he, he talks about um, two types of products in a venture world. There are sustaining technologies. Um, and a good example of that might have been the cell phone over the last 15 years. It started off as a device to give us mobility in, in telecommunications. Um, and of course, now it's got GPS, it's got text, it's probably the best camera you've got in your house, you know, on and on. Uh, it's, you know, it's your, your, your hotspot for your computer. Um, and so you got to ask yourself if somebody comes up with another wrinkle, and of course, apps have proliferated to the point where it's virtually unlimited, is that really going to change the essence of what a cell phone is about? And I think the answer is no. All of those would be sustaining technologies, arguably, to some degree, particularly if it relates to the phone, you know, going from 5G to 6G, you know, kind of thing. Disruptive technologies, on the other hand, are, are a paradigm shift. The cell phone, when it was originally brought to market, was a disruptive technology because all of a sudden we're now no longer chained to a desk, right, to a landline. We have that mobility. That's a disruptive technology. That creates new business models. The Internet would be a classic case of a disruptive technology. But, you know, what's happening on the Internet as it goes forward, is that disruptive? No, it might make it better. So you, understanding that is important because sustaining technologies have a ready market and people who appreciate what the technology does, and perhaps they're looking for value. Disruptive technologies arguably don't have a market. You're having to convince somebody of a different way of doing things, and that by its nature is difficult with human beings. And so what you tend to find is the sales cycle to get adoption is longer on a disruptive technology than it is on a sustaining technology. But the upside should be much greater, because if you're that first mover and you start to have traction with customers, and they, the value out of that technology becomes readily apparent, then the intellectual property associated with that is going to be that much greater. So it's, it's, it's a trade-off. What do you want? You know, you want the bit safer bet, but probably lower return. You're going to play that su sustaining technology. If you're really looking for the Grand Slam home run, then maybe you're looking for that, that major advance, you know, that major dis thing that changes the paradigm of, of how we, how we function. And, um, either one could be fine. It's just, that leap of faith is you need to know, have your eyes open going in. What, what's the nature of this, this product or service? Mm -hmm. Another leap of faith that you uh, mentioned to me uh, in talking to you, Bruce, was, you know, product. So do they actually have a product? <laughs> because it seems to me in the venture deal, uh, in many cases, they don't even have a product. They only have a problem that they're looking to solve. Yes. I mean, do they have something demonstrable you can touch and feel? or at least point to if it's, if it's digital and is somebody paying them for it. And, and to me that, that is a, just an enormous delineator of where do I, how do I look at this venture deal? Um, if it's a physical product, don't underestimate the challenges of creating a physical product. Uh, the days of just outsourcing it somewhere else on the planet are um, they're, they're not over, but it's much more challenged. And certainly for China in particular right now, that's, it's extremely challenged. So we're going through a period where, Companies will have to vertically integrate more than they did in the past um, and and arguably have supply chains that are closer to home. Um, and if they don't, then you need to put a real weight on not just do they have that product, have they gotten past that beta version, if you will, are they really in commercial production, and what's the vulnerability of their supply chain? So that's, you know, that's a biggie. Uh, you also mentioned the role of customers and what motivates them to buy. To your point, we are creatures of habit, aren't we? So you may have a quantifiable switching cost, but also what's not often discussed is this idea of unquantifiable switching costs, meaning I'm just set in my ways and I'm not really motivated. I like your idea, Mr. Startup Founder, but uh, you know I'm, I'm not prepared to actually change my behavior to buy. We are creatures of habit. Uh, to varying degrees, uh, I think we just define our habit differently, right? And, uh, you know, there's a classic book uh, written by Jeffrey Moore, Crossing the Chasm, that speaks to those early adopters, folks who by their nature are looking to get the new, new thing. I think fundamentally, people buy something for one of two reasons. They either buy it because of their perception of value, or 
they buy it out of fear. In other words, there's some event that's driving an urgent need uh, or want, but probably a need by that customer. Um, I'm always looking for fear. If I'm looking with a new product, uh, so to give you an example, we're financing a company that uh, basically can sterilize surgical instruments in something the size of a suitcase. Um, obviously, the world is one got more natural disasters, it seems, and then two, we've got more war, more conflict going. Um, the closer and the more quickly you can provide surgical procedure to that party that needs needs attention, the like the more likely you're going to save their life. That's about as urgent a need as I can imagine. So. You know, that type of company, above and beyond being proud of just what they do in terms of you know, helping the human existence, um, from just a, you know, sales perspective, you've got a lot of urgent urgency there. We've obviously come out of a pandemic. And you saw the pent ultimate urgency in, in, you know, the world looking for vaccines for, for COVID. So uh, I think at a much smaller scale, that same dynamic still exists company to company. What motivates the customer to buy their product? That's a that's something you need to understand and a, a leap of faith, if you will, that in fact that's the way the way it is. Yep. And I suppose the next thing, logical thing to say is, well, do you have customers? Yes or no? Yeah. No customer, no business. If you if you have customers, then there's some evidence of well, why you have customers, what motivates those customers. Um, you know, most of the venture companies that fail that I've been associated with, and I think this is true broadly in the venture market. They don't fail because they can't make the product at some scale. They fail because they don't attract enough customers. They don't really get enough revenue going. They never have a chance to generate cash flow. And that's because the mindset of the founders tends to be solution providers for the product or for the service, not, well, gosh, but who's going to buy this? They may not, you know, they, that they just by their nature may not be comfortable selling. Well, somebody's got to sell. And, and, and to be a good salesman, you've really got to be in the head of the customer, right? And, is it an individual making a decision? Is it a committee decision? Um, uh, how often do they buy? Is it a repeat? Is it the classic razor blade and razor? Um, you know, what, what is that customer acquisition cost? You know, what you tend to find is, is companies have repeating revenues. They're making a sale once, and then they enjoy, either through a SaaS model, the use of that service on an ongoing basis. That's why the valuations for SaaS would be you know, software as a service, that's why they would be so high. But even where you've got, you know, again, the razor, razor blade, you're selling the basic product and now you've got the refills that you got to sell. That's an attractive business. I would say recurring revenue sales businesses by their nature are a bit slower to develop because people to commit to that kind of a ongoing purchase relationship is harder. And that's why they tend to tend to value harder. If you're selling a product, then every day you're looking for a new customer, right? And, uh, Every day you're going to, and then you're going to compete when that product wears out to whoever else has shown up to sell something that's comparable. Both have their place, of course. Um, I wouldn't advocate one over the other. You know, I think actually a blend is probably good, but you do need to understand going in, what, what is that selling dynamic uh, to get in the customer's head as much as you can? And as you're evaluating the management team, do you get evidence that they really understand it? Was, that's probably more important that they understand it more thoroughly than you do. If they come from that industry, uh, that's a good thing. If even better, they've already been selling into that industry, perhaps from another company, another platform, then they've got some real world experience and hopefully they bring some relationships if they can make it. So, uh, but selling, selling, selling. Yeah. So that's a big heap of faith, right? So when it comes to pipeline as an example, sales pipeline, like in the case of a venture deal or a venture um, opportunity where the product's not quite mm -hmm. launched yet, it's still in development, but they may have, you know, 500 pre-orders for that product, which represents a sales pipeline of X. Mm. Would that be a good indicator of a leap of faith? Well, it would be a very good thing. Um, I think also, um, I would look for companies that, this is be a little counterintuitive, but that are not so urgent to make the sale that they're rushing the product. It kind of gets back to the scalability conversation we had. Um, it's a tree, it's a balance. That's why business is hard, right? Is on the one hand, you want to know you've got a customer to make the sales. On the other hand, if you rush to those early sales or if those early sales, if you don't manage expectations, then, you know, you may have built a wall for yourself, right? In terms of scaling, scaling the business. So it, it obviously depends on the application. 
Um, you want to come to market uh, that so that you can grow with demand. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to commit to so much demand that now you're upside down because you don't can't fill the capacity you've, you've created. You know that you're sp you're spending money on. So it's it's tricky, but um, ag again, you can't spend enough time looking at the sales dynamics for the product. If they've never sold the product, that's one enormous leap of faith. Um, and then even if they are selling product, can they scale? You know, got a couple of them. Well, let's double click on scale. I think oftentimes I've found venture deals go south because they raise too much money too early, mm. meaning they haven't quite reached what's called product market fit, as you know. Um, and so they don't know the unit economics. They don't know that if I put $1 in in marketing that I'm going to get $3 out yeah. in sales. Um, and so this idea of scaling too early or not getting the timing right or not being ready to, to quite scale, I imagine there's another leap of faith to consider. At some point, there's going to be an inflection where you go from a development stage company to an operating business, right? And that the skill sets that are required are different. Now you are talking to people who've worked at bigger companies who maybe got the degrees in you know, industrial production or the experience in industrial production, you know. That that same person may not have been the startup, the startup mentality, but but you do need to move to that. And also you need to know that senior management, uh, they're humble enough to know where they've hit their their limitation. You know, we used to call it it was been written about the Peter principle. You know, they've just gotten to their point of inadequacy basically. Um they still own a big chunk of this company. They're still destined to make a lot of money, and they should be incented to bring in the people who are most capable at filling those roles for where that company is. But egos being what they are, sometimes that doesn't happen. And you're right; they 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 really are, are out of their depth at that point. So again, uh, we've talked broadly: sales, big leap of faith; sales, making sales, meeting sales, etc. Bruce, uh, final leap of faith uh, is really about competition. So uh, I know that no business can really exist without competition. So it's inherent in every mm. business. Um, when you're evaluating a venture deal, how are you looking at competition? Well, again, sustainable technologies, disruptive technologies. If it's a sustain sustaining technology, there's a world out there of companies probably offering comparable. Well, first of all, you're competing with the status quo, right? And it, you actually are disruptive too, but you know, you've got people who've got their entrenched product. I mean, some of us are carrying Samsungs and some of us are carrying LGs and some of us are carrying, you know, obviously apples, you know, what does it take to move somebody out of one of those products? I mean, that's kind of classic, very entrenched markets. When you're talking about newer products, it is hard, you know, to, uh, um, to fully understand that, I guess what I would say is in the presentation, you know, beware of the company that says, well, we really don't have any competition. I, I mean, I don't, I don't care. It's a big planet out there <laughs> and somebody's bound to be doing something that, that's somewhat comparable. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to necessarily even absolutely have the best solution. Okay. You just have to have a solution. That's a step that that's a material advance to the customer and, and enough customers are inclined to buy it, that kind of gets you to the, you know, the classic Sony, um, you know, uh, beta versus VHS argument that, you know, one would say Sony had a better solution, but they didn't get industry adoption for that solution. So you ended up, again, this is dating myself. We're not in this world anymore with tapes anymore, but, but, you know, you've had that from time to time where the best solution didn't become the predominant solution. It was just a better position, better marketed solution. And, you know, in, in that particular case, you needed OEMs to, to take on that technology, to, to embrace that technology and understanding the incentives for the counterparties that you have in business. You know, business should be a third win. You win, I win, we win. You know, we've created a win that super, that it really goes beyond We both need to win, you know, and, 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 you know, I would also, it's kind of a bit off track here, but, Beware the entrepreneur that, you know, isn't willing to compromise. I mean, I, I don't think you should compromise on the forward momentum of the business, but I do think business, you know, it, it is about compromise. And, and also you need to look at people coming out of professional ranks into entrepreneurship where 
their way was the highway, right? I mean, with respect to the doctors who might be watching this, doctors are classics in terms of a personal profile as in entrepreneurship is, you know, if you're in surgery, um, you don't want somebody to be making decisions by committee. You want the actual best expertise and you're gonna gotta go with that individual. Because of that, the people who fill those ranks in different medical specialties tend to be very self-assured. Uh, sure, they may have some colleagues they, they refer to, but they're ready to make a decision and stand by that decision. And then obviously a lot is at stake in those decisions. Business uh, really is about listening to your market, you know, being ready to pivot, realizing when that first decision maybe didn't play out and, and, and you know, not just blindly driving it off the cliff until, until you failed. So um, anyway, that's why we call it adventure. Well, exactly. Or adventure. But I love your analogy about the doctor, right? So if you're going to go have brain surgery, do you want uh, someone that you don't know anything about? Is you're Googling best brain surgeons, Ooh. right? Um, and because you want to find the best provider in a sea of brain surgeons, you know, or comp uh, a competition in that space. So you want to deal with the rock star who's going to, you know, position him or herself in the context of competition as the best choice. And has a track record as such, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But, you know, in a business setting with, with entrepreneurship, um, yes, you want someone that has some track record of success. I mean, I know venture capitalists who will only invest in the first time deal of, of an entrepreneur because their concern is the confidence level they get from the first time success, assuming it was a success. Well, one, they've got personal resources and liquidity. Failure is not quite as a big of a problem for them as it might've been before, but, but you know, on the other hand, you can make an equally strong argument that with the right personality, um, you know, th that experience is something you want to look for. So, Bruce, thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's a yeah. lot of leaps of faith uh, <laughs> and venture deal. But, you know, it's complex. And I love this idea of nine leaps of faith. And I think as an investor community, if we're aware of what to look for in venture deals, then we can start to ask better questions. And with better questions comes better answers. So thank you for being here. You bet. Thanks, man. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.